How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks all over again. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. And we're here with Rocky Latka. We're going to be talking to him in just a minute. But um, what's up with you, Mr. Campbell? What's new? Oh, when's the last time we shot a three-show day? I know. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's been fun. And usually, I have a, a whiskey at this time of day yeah. when, when it's the last show of the day, but I am abstaining from alcohol during the week. Oh, there you go. So, I've been doing this since the 1st of January. Ah, uh, that's smart. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. Where I have now, be, you know, in the new office, I've actually put the crystal decanter filled with whiskey in the office, so I don't even have to. <laughs> I don't have to get out my chair. Oh, <laughs> okay. If you had a drip tube, that would yeah. be even better. I have. Uh, I think there's Chivas Regal in there right now. You know, after shooting that that uh, Windows w- Weekly stuff, people are bugging me about just make a YouTube channel like that. And it's like one of the things I could add to a channel like that is like, what's in the decanter? <laughs> you know, what's in your decanter? Time. What's in my yeah. decanter? Like. Decanters are out of style ever since bottles became cheap. Well, and for decanters for whiskey are kind of like, nah, why do you do that? Decanters are for wine, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, these the it's really just a, a thing you put. Once upon a time, there weren't bottles for whiskey, right? Mm. And so you would take you would take your decanter, your bottle. Well, let be clear. Your servant would take your decanter <laughs> down to the whiskey purveyor, and they would fill it from the barrel, and then you'd right. you know, go back like, home on a whole like a growler carriage. for whiskey. Right. Exactly. That's the way it used to be, but yeah, today yeah. we have bottles. In fact, we have fancy bottles. But right. Yeah, the things are good. All right. Well, cool. Let's start things off right with a little better no framework. <laughs> All right, man. What do you got? Well, you you don't have to know it, so you better not. You're not better know it, and it's you, certainly not a framework. You don't don't. You should know this. You well, yeah. Don't under, underplay yourself. This is seriously good music. Okay, so my better know framework is my band's website, which I I don't know as if I've even talked about my band's website, FranklinBrothersBand.com. No. But on franklinbrothersband.com, you can see our schedule, but more importantly, you can see a slew of live videos that we've recorded of the band. And we, meaning me, Mm. um, the band uses a a very cool technology for, it's like all the latest stuff, but I've been doing it since like 2012, where you have this headless mixer, right, with inputs and outputs and headphone preamps and all that stuff everybody connects to it even including the sound guy sound guy with an ipad all the musicians with iphones or or you know whatever kind of phone and they can dial in their own personal mix each person gets their own mix that they can modify with their phone and so it takes monitors off the stage everybody gets in-ear headphones and we've been working like this for a long long time nice one of the side benefits of using this is i could just plug in a computer and it will record you know 32 tracks all the channels yeah all the channels and for the audio wonks right after in the signal flow right after the preamp so you plug in the microphone the preamp amplifies it and then it gets recorded so there's no effects there's no nothing on it. it's dry yeah yeah no i know um, minimal room yeah yeah, and so as long as I get a good signal and it's not too hot or too low, I can take that back in the studio and mix it and then sync it up to videos and stuff. So that's what I've done with all of these videos. So it also occurs to me, like, no monitors means there's a lot more room on the stage. Yeah. Heck of a lot more portable rig. Like, you can... More... Yeah. Yeah. More control yeah, is more... Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's important that you don't get all the bleed from the monitors going into sure. the microphones, which makes it very difficult to mix the front of the house. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, I, I recently published a new video which is a new mix of an older uh recording that we did jay and i did with a few other people some people horns from the band some not uh of the thrill is gone Mm -hmm. and so this is a song that bb king covered he didn't write it originally but he he has the most famous version of it right from 1969 and the guy who played bass 
on that song with BB, with BB, who actually kind of wrote the groove, according to him, like he came up with that groove. He played it with us. Wow. Jerry Jamat. Who's, I mean, a legend. A legend. Yeah. R- as Schofield told me, he's R&B royalty, right. dude. How the hell did that happen? So, well, and well, I mean, we were talking before, but that may, the BB King version may not even be the best version that Jerry played on. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because he also did the Aretha Franklin version. Well, you're thinking of Son of a Preacher Man. Oh, no, I'm mixing up songs. Yeah, Son of a Preacher Man. Yeah, so we also did Son of a Preacher Man. You can find that. But me, idiot, I had no idea that he did that with Aretha Mm. on Aretha Franklin. And so we're playing it in the band, and my drummer says, hey, have you ever heard Aretha Franklin's version of that? No. So we listened to it. It's great. And then I look, hey, that sounds like Jerry Jamat playing bass. <laughs> sure enough, it is. And I asked enough. him, I asked him, hey, do you know Son of a Preacher Man? <laughs> <laughs> do, do I? Do I? Maybe I do. Rocky, you can chime in here because the reason that I'm showing this is because I remember you came to see my band at Sailfest in New London one year. I remember seeing you from the stage. Yeah, absolutely. My wife and I came all the way out there just for that, actually. It was awesome. That was so cool. There's nothing better than a summer night and fireworks. Yeah, with the water in the background and the weather and the and yeah and and uh, it, it was a fantastic experience. And you guys really knocked it out of the park. I was very impressed. Thanks. Well, I'm very proud of this band, and we don't make any money, but we sure have a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Anyway, that's my better no framework. Have fun with that. And uh, who's talking to us today, Richard? Uh, grabbed a comment off of show 1620. Holy man, going back a little bit. This is uh, from January 2019 with one Rocky Laka hmm. when we were talking about migrating to .NET standard back when that yeah. was a thing. Yeah, Because, of course, he was doing it with CSLA as well, so he had s- certainly some good opinions about it. Hmm. And a uh, longtime listener, Tony Drake, who's out of Melbourne, uh, Australia. Melbourne. And I would also point out, one of my favorite comments of all time was the one that he sent us back in 2011 when we did that code mash with the Java posse. Oh, yeah. That, that was a lot of bourbon was involved. As a I lot recall. of bourbon was a, had. A lot of bourbon. And I, th- as if I recall correctly, those guys got hammered and we were kind of professionals. Oh, no, because that was the thing. If you make fun of the other guy's stack, you have to take a drink, which is why, because <laughs> I was thirsty, I let off with you know, a bunch of Java jokes. <laughs> As you do. But no, uh, I think a couple of them fun. were sleeping by the end of that show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, times. that's not the comment I'm going to read. I'm going to read Tony's comment in relation to the .NET standard issues, which okay. is, uh, he said, I love the show highlights the slight mess we've gotten into. I want to say something as someone who is building a large app with CSLA and loved it. Now working in Core 2.2 with DLLs. Oh, man, Core 2. And mm. Standard 2.0 and 4.71 which can use the DLLs from standard 2.0, mm-hmm. uh, and an Angular 7 spa, as the UI is hosted on Azure. I came from 15 years as a PIC developer in the 1990s. Wow. I only learned SQL and .NET in 2005. I share those stories. Wasn't that ADP, PIC Basic? Something like that, yeah. No, you're, I'm with you. Yeah. It's amazing how much change we do go through as software engineers, and I would love to have a beer with Rocky and you both. I have no real friends who know the pain we all feel of being in this odd, odd business. Yeah. Imagine if making bridges involved redoing the theories and practices every five years. <laughs> if any, no, no, thanks. No, I don't no, I don't think that. it's better. Like, <laughs> you, know, you know, the big, when our software crashes, you just reboot, right? Yeah. When the bridge crashes, people die. Yes. It's not good. Uh, if anything I got from this podcast, it is stay current. So I feel smug that my current business solutions are moving 100% to core and keeping up with the latest JavaScript frameworks and packages like Automapper and so on is the best way forward. One thing you forgot to mention is how hard it can be to relearn this old tech to keep it going. Mm. Uh, getting a developer in who's never seen WPF or WinForms, and while they know .NET, it's all new, so it can't necessarily be easy. Mm-hmm. Keep on the latest or previous release is my rule. Keep current. Yeah. Good advice. Can't argue that, Tony. True enough. Uh, and thanks so much for your comment. I mean, it, it was a few years ago, but not that many. So a copy of Music Code Buy is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Code Buy, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and are reading the show, 
We'll send you a copy of Music Code. And you could certainly send us a tweet or an X or whatever the hell you call it these days. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. But the cool kids are hanging out on Mastodon. I'm at Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at Mastodon.social. Send us a tweet. I believe, Rocky, you're also on Mastodon, aren't you? I am. I'm Rocky Latka at Fostodon.org. Fostodon. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, this is usually where I introduce the guest, although Rocky needs no introduction. But just in case you don't know who Rocky Latka is, he wrote the very first book on .NET with Billy Hollis that I ever read, ever. Ever, ever. Uh, I always think of Billy and Rocky as your inspiration for Donnet Rocks full stop. Yeah. I mean, basically, when we would hang out in the behind the scenes, you know, in the speaker's lounge at conferences and stuff, we'd be having these great conversations. And I was like, these have got to be shared. Yeah. Yeah. So good old friends. That and a disturbing uh, addiction to a couple of uh, mechanics from Boston. Yeah. And there you go, Donnet Rocks. <laughs> I still <laughs> listen to those reruns. <laughs> those guys are retired. I know. Well, well one the, of them died. And one's passed. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy. Yeah. Car talk. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm a public radio junkie and I always like this stuff. And you, you kids got to remember that we've been doing this show. I've been mm. doing this show since 2002, which is like yeah. two years before the word podcast happened. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm and the new guy. I only did it. I was only a guest in 2004. So we're going to rename this show Three Old Guys Talk About the Old Times. This is some ah, there very, you go. very old guys. That's true. <laughs> we're all Rocky. a lot grayer on this video. Oh, my, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rocky, what's up? What's new? Hey, I am talking to you from, uh, well, sunny. Uh, Palm Springs, California. What's up with that? I was expecting us to share snow stories because you're supposed to be in Minnesota. That's well, and that's why I'm not in Minnesota right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Very good. My, my wife and I are like, yeah, let's get out of here before it gets too bad. And you've had you know, quite enough of that. Yeah. Are your kids grown and gone now, Rocky? They are. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The uh, oldest is uh, just, well married and they just bought their uh, house and the uh, younger one uh just got engaged uh he, he just proposed oh, wow. to his that. longtime girlfriend so very exciting and that's excellent one of them's a bass player too right yeah actually both well both of them um uh, are amazing musicians but uh the oldest one plays bass and tuba and the uh, younger one well now primarily is the lead guitar in his band ah. uh, but he plays everything kind of he's kind of like you carl he's uh puts and i i remember you and i had this conversation probably with my son actually um about how it's you know he's got talent right just yeah. kind of a natural talent but that mm -hmm. by itself doesn't do anything unless you put in the work uh and you, yeah. know, you see people like him and you get up on stage and just to the rest of us effortlessly yep uh you know do yep. uh, tear it up tear it up and and uh, people come up to me so, and they say yeah. how long have you been playing and i say oh about 20 minutes <laughs> mm -hmm. you no know. you're right you you have to do every day and people don't realize that they think oh you know that's why people think that people are born with this ability like they can just it just oozes out of them and well, it does after 40 years of doing the yeah. same thing every day you know i mean i do think there's some innate um you know talent or or something that some people have and others maybe have less of but uh honestly i'm not so sure yeah. i mean when i started taking piano lessons when i was three it was really really hard four or five or whatever it was it was really really hard and you know it was only because my mother made me practice and I don't mean like you're really out of practice, honey. I mean, you've practice. Uh, I yeah. encourage you to read the book. Talent is overrated. I have. Yeah. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. And I, and then, yeah. And it's because this was a couple of psychologists that were going to go to find talent mm -hmm. and in the process found out eh, it doesn't exist. Interesting. Yeah. That you could always find other evidence of effort. That, and environment and yeah. upbringing. Yeah. Um, oh, God, Clara, my youngest daughter, who's 21 now, she said to me when I was in Spain visiting her, she said, Dad, I'm really mad at you. I'm like, why? Because you didn't make me practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, this is a fine how do you do, right? Yeah. It's like you didn't want to and you wouldn't. And I did try. Yeah. Yep. 
didn't try hard enough. But yeah, no, I really, you know, I would read the book, Talent is Overrated, and just yep. watch the journey these folks went on to try yeah. and quantify talent and realize behind every remarkable set of abilities is a big pile of effort. Yeah, absolutely. What did he say? 10,000 hours is what it takes? Well, that's that's another set of metrics. But it was the big thing. You know, it was things like, why are athletes consistently born in January? Top tier athletes are born in January or February. Right. Because of the way the schools select their grades. So they tend yep. to be biggest in the class, which means they're, mm-hmm. quote, talented, which means they get additional training. Yeah. There was a right. thing about hockey players in Canada. Too, That's right. right. It's, it yeah. applies there for the same and for the exactly the same reason because of the way yeah. the system works, and it's but it's always the same case that you get into as soon as you dig, dig in a little because they were perceived as talented, mm. they got extra training. And the extra training is the important part. Well, and this pertains to programming as well. I mean, if you don't practice all, if you're mm-hmm. not doing it all the time, after a while, you kind of atrophy and you forget things. And uh, I'm also, it's it's amazing how little practice we do. We tend to just do. We do the mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. And so you rarely, I feel like you press, you rarely press against the edges of your skill unless you do it intentionally. Like the yeah. byproduct of this is we're prone to pick the new library, to not want to build the app the same way again, even though it's... You know, talk about bad bridge building. It's like, well, that bridge worked great. I'm never doing that again. I'm going to do it a totally different way this time. Fortunately, in our business, there's so many shiny new toys that we can yeah. play with that we, it's not it's not a sacrifice. Like I just I just ordered a Quest Three, mm. and uh, the only because Jeff Fritz told me that you can program it with Maui. Because it's an essentially an Android device. You can write right. a Maui app and run it on and your Quest 3. VR. So I'm it. like, I'm all over that, honey. I got to buy one of these. It's going to cost $1,000. And she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. It's for work. She didn't say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, what's it for? Don't mm. you have one? <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, no so, question. Let's talk about CSLA 8, Rocky. I'm happy to talk about that. Mm. I'm having a blast. Sp- speaking bet. of of you know learning new things and and actually I suppose doing practice, it's uh, um, you know I mean, CSLA of course has been around in one form or another since 1996. I want to say 97. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know it, it's just for me. Um, at its core, hopefully it provides great value to a whole lot of people. But for me personally, it's the way that I get to uh, go out and learn whatever is new and shiny. Right. And, yeah. you know, so CSLA 8 is primarily about .NET 8. Um, and really the thing that has changed the most between .NET 7 and .NET 8 is Blazor. Yep. And trying to um, figure out the, the depths of these changes that have happened in Blazor and yeah. uh, make CSLA continue to work. Uh, it's been quite challenging. I got to say it's a, it really uh, forces a person to dig into parts of .NET and Blazor that I hopefully most people never have to look at. Right. Hmm. Now, do you do a new CSLA version for every version of .NET typically? I try. Um, yeah. And also for some years now we've been doing semantic versioning so we we store up all of the um, breaking changes and you know so nowadays once a year we get to release all the breaking changes um mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> surprise and, yeah exactly <laughs> uh you know and, and so yeah if microsoft were to change their cadence then we might have to reevaluate right because you right you know if once a year is fine. In fact, that's probably as fast as anybody would ever want. But there's mm, plenty of people pushing you know. saying it's too fast. Still, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely right, absolutely right. And mm-hmm. um, you know, both both the .NET stuff and and the CSLA, um, you know, every every breaking change has um, a real cost to mm-hmm. everybody that uses you know your framework or your tool or whatever it is, and trying to keep that in mind and minimize the impact is an important piece of any long-term project, I think. But how do, how do you, why do you need a breaking change at this point? Is it really, really an art re-architecture or is this just reflecting breaking changes in the framework? So they come in different flavors, I guess. Sometimes 
you know, when, when .NET introduces generics or, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Blazor absolutely requires that you support dependency injection or you can't play. Right. Mm. Um, then, or async and await, you know, these, these are things that, um, you have to adopt, I believe, right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in order to remain modern and current mm-hmm. and yeah. Otherwise, why are you calling it eight? Yeah. Yeah. And why are you using CSLA if you're not using generic? Otherwise, why are you using CSLA? That's right. Yeah. If, it, if yeah. If if CSLA quits working, um, you know, with uh, uh, Blazor, then what's the point? And right. you know, so I so some of them I'm I'm like a victim of. You know what I mean? In the, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no, you you should support Blazor. Blazor requires dependency injection. Ta da! You have to make major changes. You should try yep. having a website with a hundred Blazor videos on YouTube <laughs> with accompanying uh, repos of code. And trying to stay current on that is a daunting task. <laughs> Probably get done by the time uh, .NET nine comes out. Yep. Nice, right, right. But I've I, already started horrible. the process. But I always have to say, you know, this is for .NET eight. If you want .NET seven, watch this video. Go to this repo. It's it's going to get fun. <laughs> the the other big category um, is feature enhancements or tech debt. Right. Um, yeah. That that are not imposed by my, you know, essentially not imposed by the platform. But you know, I keep learning, and and the people that use CSLA, the community, uh, you know, comes in and says, "Hey, you know, why does it? Why does this work this way? Wouldn't it be better if it worked that other way?" Mm. And you know, sometimes we'll go back and forth, have a conversation, um, and and sometimes the answer is no, it should stay the way it is. But other times. It's like you know you're right. the The world has changed, or, right. or we got we got it wrong when we built this piece of the this feature ten years ago. Um, you know, yeah, and, or or was it right at the time? Like I got to imagine, often you get suggested that this would be a better way, and in the first couple of times it said you're like, nah, it's not sufficiently different. But then more time passes, and the environments pass, and suddenly that mm. weird idea two years ago is getting rather mainstream now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and again, you know, I try to minimize these breaking changes because there's a, such a huge cost to yeah, people. Right. Um, but sometimes, you know, independency injection and async and await are two that were uh, really tremendous. They had just, you know, because they're, they're viral. As soon as you start using yeah. async and await in your code, it spreads everywhere. And, <laughs> yeah. and why is it a good it? way, right? Well, oh, yeah. it is a good way, but it forces <laughs> all your consumers to adopt it too. Right. Um, yeah. And dependency and injection is, aspect. yeah, yeah. And dependency and, injection you know, is the same thing. As soon as you start using it, um, you know, a whole lot of things that were pretty common, um, you know, like using static helper methods to do, to simplify some coding, mm-hmm. psh, you can't use static methods and dependency injection. They, they don't go together. And so, yeah, one or the other. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then it, 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 you, you also consider like blazer, for example, just web programming in general in async, mm-hmm. you know, a web request is a synchronous operation. If you think about it, I, I send a, a request, I get a response, something changes, but now with, frameworks like blazer little pieces of the ui can update independent of other pieces of the ui and uh you know uh, if when do you call await invoke async state has changed versus state has changed you know when you know these questions like most people who come from a uh you know a, a windows let's say programming background and then get into the web they don't understand this stuff. It's like, why, what, when do I do that? Yeah, that's true. Although I think if you're coming from WPF into Blazor, it's a little easier because for a lot of WPF apps, things have been async for a long time. That's true. Um, yeah. The, the yeah. very old stuff was probably still synchronous, but, you know, and but Windows Forms, that's the one, right? If you've got a Windows yeah. Forms <laughs> code base and that's been your life, yeah. Um, all this You're async thinking, stuff. You, yeah, uh, yeah, you've been thinking synchronously for a long time. By the way, Rocky, uh, we I think we say this every time we talk to you, but 
I I did. A, I'm actually not done yet. I'm working on a Windows Forms project for a friend of mine who's got a little software company dealing with machines and stuff. So he's reading from data from an industrial machine that's doing something, spitting out some CSV data. I'm graphing it, doing some standard deviation and charting and all that stuff, and it's fun. But uh, it's really been amazing, like how how much I missed Windows Forms. <laughs> The, yep. the designer in wind forms is the anomaly. Yeah. Right. Like ne- never to be, it seems to be never to be repeated. No. Right. This one, one great designer that we are, are prone to measuring everything against. And I always say the same thing here is because it's pixel based and the world moved on from pixels into, you know, everything else. Sort of flow based. Yeah. Flow based. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And if we could just go back to pixels. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, you know, but, but no, that's not even true. I mean, Windows Forms at at the end, I guess at the end. Um, what what end yeah. are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> when, when it when it quit changing radically, um, yeah. you know, when in two thousand five, um, you know, had the reflow capabilities and re, you know could, could handle huge yeah, right. screens and little screens and mm-hmm. um, all, all the things that HTML and XAML were designed to solve, um, mm-hmm. and yet somehow Windows Forms did it in a way that um, was still drag and drop, S- still yeah. drag and drop. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now that was mm-hmm. an old, old quote of yours about why WPFE was succeeding when WPF was struggling. It's because his WPFE, aka Silverlight, uh, was designed for the web, and in the web development, we're used to lousy tools. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious as to what you did for uh, Blazor in CSLA in .NET 8 that was different for Blazor in .NET 7. Well, the big thing. Yeah, there's there's several, but but the biggest thing in Blazor eight is this new um, blended uh, model with different rendering, right? So render modes, yeah, and and even the the default template uh, for a Blazor app now, um, the home page is a server static page. Uh, mm-hmm. The weather page is a server static streaming page mm-hmm. and the counter page runs in uh, web assembly uh, in the browser or server and, or both or, or, or server or both. A- and yeah, but it's the only page with interactivity. And in all cases, it server pre renders the, yes. the counter page does, which yes. isn't always obvious if you're, especially in a dev environment, but when you start trying to, for example, say that I would like to um, have some sort of consistent state within my app. Mm. Um, you know, in, in prior to this point, your consistent state could always be managed in a scoped service, right? Whether that was on Blazor server or WebAssembly, because your code was always, always running within a consistent DI scope, dependency injection scope. Right. Well, now on a server static page, every time that page gets rendered, a scope is created and destroyed for the life of the page rendering for that, that fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. And if your code is running on WASM, you get a scope for the length that you're running in WASM. Um, And if you're running in a server interactive mode, you get a scope for the length that you're running in server interactive. Mm. But you think about that counter page, it server pre renders. So a scope is created it server pre-renders, then the scope is destroyed, mm-hmm. then the page flickers because it switched to WASM, That's for right. example, and a new scope is created. Um, and so any attempt on your part to maintain consistent state um, <laughs> is, is just gone. It's, it's yeah. very hard and, uh, until everything settles in. And I noticed this in the, in the basic WebAssembly thing, you know, if you for example, put a button on the home page and give the home page some interactivity that you could try clicking that button the first time you see it, but it ain't going to happen until WebAssembly comes down and then you're going to get your on after render with the first render set to true. And then now, now you can use it. Well, and that's, that comes, uh, 
just ignoring the CSLA aspects, that's a UI design thing, right? And yeah. I think Microsoft in their template should have done a better job, like with the counter page mm -hmm. of showing how you sh that button, the counter button uh, should have been disabled until it becomes yes. interactive, which yep. you can do, but it's left. It's kind of like a math problem, right? It's, it's left yeah. to the, uh, left up to the reader to figure out how right. to do this thing, right? We're still um, trying to sort out how auto mode is useful. Right now, it really isn't because there's an outstanding bug. This is a bug that I found, and I went to report it, and I missed it by four hours. Somebody wow. had added it as a bug. And then Steve Sanderson jumped in and everybody, and they confirmed, yep, this is a problem. So if you're in auto mode, what's supposed to happen is you immediately should get a server-side rendered, you know, Blazor server interactivity. So when I click that button on the homepage like that I was just talking about, it, you shouldn't have that. You should have that server rendering immediately, the server-side uh, code. But what ends up happening is it works just like the WebAssembly template, which is that nothing works until WebAssembly comes down. And then you get this brief moment of server interactivity and then when you refresh the page you're in wasm yep it's yep. so that's a bug that they're working on but but it that'll just make it, it more complicated point, though yeah because then it'll go through three modes <laughs> instead of two so well, you already have three right you well know, but it, server side rendering for the very first page and then you when wasm comes down you finally get server and then when you refresh you get wasm this is the way it works <laughs> so the, the, so I initially, I wrote a blog post actually, um, cause I, I worked through a solution, a solution to this problem, which is, um, if, if you ignore the WASM piece, it's actually not too bad because you can maintain an in-memory, um, cache, mm -hmm. uh, you have to figure out some way to have a unique identifier for the user, which I used a cookie, um, with a GUID, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. Um, and then you can look up the user's state over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, right. e every time the scope gets recreated, you go back and look up the, the state and, and grab it, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the user can have consistent state across all these spaces. And you might be telling me, Rocky, a you shouldn't have a any global state. And I'm like, well, in a business app, no, you have to. In a business app, you know, you got to know the user's department or, I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff that you have to yeah. have, right? I solved this problem, Rocky, by using a cascading app state component and, you know, implementing that as a cascading parameter. And that seems to work really, really well. But does it uh, and, bridge to WASM yeah. and then back? That's the question. Yeah, it seems to. If you mute, if you mutate the state on the WASM side, does it go back mm -hmm. to the server? Because I uh, are you talking about having mixed? So if you have one page with server interactivity and one page with WASM interactivity, does it work across both? Yes, I'm talking about that default template where, or or maybe. So here's the thing I think, Carl, is when you look at this new render mode, I find it very compelling because most apps are um, have a lot of pages that just show data. Yeah, and then some pages that are very interactive, mm -hmm. and so the ability to have server static, you know, static rendered pages that just do the show data part. Right. I mean, that's so fast and simple yep. and awesome. Yep. And I want that. Yep. And seamlessly, I want when the user goes to a page that's a data entry page, um, I want that to happen. Right. You want the WASM quick interaction effect. Well, or, or server side. I mean, either way, but yeah, that's absolutely right. What I don't want is if you have a static homepage and then you go to one that's interactive, I don't want to have to wait for WebAssembly to download. I right. want that to happen behind yeah, the well, scenes. That, right. That's what this is all about, right? Yeah. Is hiding the, the big hall. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Because I, I do think all, in the end, especially for a large line of business apps, you do want WASM because you want to be leveraging that client side um, memory and yeah, lowering the server load. So it's obvious what the solution is for the developer. Don't use like per page or per component rendering if you have state. Well, I would pick one. I would pick WebAssembly, sure. which you're going to have that bonk in the beginning. But then after WebAssembly is downloaded, it's cached and all that stuff, and you've got your state. Or or read my blog post, Carl, and just it works. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now I built it into CSLA. That's that's the even better uh, part, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking so about. If here. you're using CSLA, um, mm. 
then the, all this this problem has been solved within the framework and hopefully at some point Microsoft solves it inside of Blazor wow. right but in the meantime you know they the last I was seeing on any of the stuff on on GitHub for Blazor is well we might consider doing it for .NET nine and uh, oh, that stinks right so yeah it's, yeah. it's not going to happen soon and gentlemen. I got to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. And then we're back. It's Dot and Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey, hey, hey. And over there is Rocky Laka hanging out in the sun because that's unfair. It is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send some Minnesota snow to you in Here the mail. There you go. Yeah, thank you much. No. <laughs> the, this is the reward exactly for empty it. nesting that you can just go, you know, what we could do is work from Palm Springs and off That's you go. right. Yep. As long that. as you got internet, life is good. Yeah, like you make right. it work. Yeah. I appreciate the render modes and, and really overcoming these issues of how do we make this perform where we'll still all of those benefits. Like it, it does feel like they're smoothing off the edges mm -hmm. of the challenge of working with WASM, which is just this kind of hefty initial load. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I mean, they're doing, they're moving in the right direction. Um, I, I got to say it feels like the mixed render mode stuff in .NET 8 isn't complete <laughs> no it's not yeah it is v1 of what they called universal right yeah exactly yeah. but they were there's the thing though they were so excited about saying now you can just sprinkle interactivity wherever you want you want a little wasm over here you want a little server over there and that's all cool but as rocky's saying wreaks havoc with dependency injection yeah. and any kind of state management right so i say pick pick one web assembly or server make it global and use that for now and and i and I totally appreciate that, Carl. I really do. But I want it all. So <laughs> I'm, uh, that's, this, this is what I've been. Now. Yeah, I want it all. And I want it now. Yeah. <laughs> Ru Ruka salt. So that, yeah, that, oh, that, that state thing was, is one big issue. Another one is um, user identity uh, being consistent across all of these yeah. render modes. Yeah. And there appears to be, uh, I don't know if it's an intentional like feature thing or if it's a bug. It's we've we've got some discussion on the Blazor GitHub about this, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes, well, you can always use the authentication state provider in the UI, mm -hmm. but it's disallowed for some reason in library code. Hmm. And so if you've got a DLL with business logic and that business logic includes needing to know the user identity, which so you, you can't know, inject it is no, it says it's not allowed for use. Um, and so I actually have it's such a terrible message. That's terrible. Like, isn't it? Oh, right. It's like, yeah, yep. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a <laughs> runtime message that comes up and no, says yeah this, this service is not allowed in this context or something to that effect right so you had to put some band-aids around that so that you I can did. inject something that looks like a principle just for the requirements right well actually what i did is i created an abstract way to get at the current user that either pulls it from http context or from the authentication state provider depending on which one's actually available I thought we weren't supposed to use HTTP context anymore. Well, they changed the way that all works in Blazor 8. Mm -hmm. In Blazor in Blazor 6 and 7, you really couldn't use it because it wasn't consistent or and or available. But now because of the way the server rendering stuff works, I want to say, I, I, I can't tell you why, but you can actually use it when in the cases that you can't get at the... Um, authentication state provider http mm. context appears to always be available and stable wow yeah it's it's rocky locker ladies and gentlemen mm -hmm. he'll be here for another 20 minutes try the veal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also th these are things you know we'll have to revise after nine yeah, oh right? like i hope you, so these are this is feels like placeholder code it's like for now we will do this yes it, it sure feels yep. so really what you're saying is that csla 8 if you're not using it with Blazor in .NET 8, you're a fool. It sounds like that. I like. I want to use this everywhere now. Well, I mean, hopefully CSLA continues to be super useful for your other code too. But 
It, yes, I'm, I'm trying desperately to tackle these really big issues in Blazor 8. Yeah. Um, but that, I think you're also bridging the path for folks who've built with CSLA for wind forms. It's like, if you want to go Blazor, you can. Yes, you know, yes. It's not a huge leap. That is exactly right. Yeah. Uh, that's been wow. forever. That's been the promise of CSLA, right? Is is you can switch UI technologies with minimal to zero, hopefully zero, but it, the most minimal change to your you know, business logic and, and domain right. model and stuff. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I, I appreciate that. Like that's, you've done all this work to make a good domain model for your business, you know, but you do need to change clients. That's, that's the demand. Although I, I got to think the shifting CSLA to the cloud was not a trivial thing back in the day either. Well, but see, CSLA was designed initially from the ground up to be a distributed world or distributed tool. And so yeah, um, shifting to the cloud, certainly like things like Kubernetes, we did all sorts of cool stuff that became right. possible, but it didn't impact it had no um, breaking change. Yeah, you know, like like right. You didn't take a dependency that needed a VM anywhere. No, no. To make it hard, you know, make it expensive to run in the cloud. Everybody's existing code, you just could choose to deploy it in the cloud or not, and and yay, right? Right. As an in app service, I presume. Uh, app service, and then ultimately containers, and right, and then. And then what we did do is add a bunch of cool features for like routing to subgroups of containers that are running. Um, you know, you think about Kubernetes, um, you know, you might have some pods that are running on machines that have GPUs and other pods that are not. Mm -hmm. And, and so, right. And so you want to work load specific routing. And, mm -hmm. and so CSLA supports that. So you can say, well, this, nice. you know, this particular um, object, this class, business class has to run on a server that has a GPU versus, right. you know, others don't. So, yeah. And you don't want to provision everything with GPUs because they're charging a ton for those these days. Exactly. Yes, they are. <laughs> yep. Everybody does. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but that, you know that's really the cloud natification of CSLA. That yeah, you, Did you, you say know, natification. Natification. Na I love wow. that word. That's you, awesome. You told me last week to make new words. I'm pulling, I'm pulling <laughs> just, my weight, man. You're just following instructions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man! But I mean, isn't it amazing to think in those terms now that we literally need to route by workload requirement for cost efficiency? Right. Right. I mean, most people don't. Let's let's be fair. Right. But when you do, yes. you really do. And, you yeah. know, having that and capability, right. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing with this diversity of client. It's like more and more choices for working on, on these clients and, and the advantages that they have. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, apparently, um, Carl was just telling me that I can run CSLA on an, uh, what was it? An Oculus or, or what was that? Oh, Oh uh, yeah, uh, Quest Three. Qu yeah, Quest, Quest three. three. Right, right, right. Yeah. If it runs in a Android, Maui. Yeah, yeah, because CSLA works great in Maui too. So there you go. There you go. CSLA on a on a Quest Three. That's uh, now I need to go buy a Quest Three. <laughs> 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 You're going to be able to talk to she who must be obeyed. Well, it's a business uh, yeah. expense. It's yeah. a business expense. It'll be tax deductible and, and Beat Saber, but you know whatever. <laughs> All right, you guys don't pay, play games. Like if you talk about the definitive VR game, like the game, it's Beat Saber. Just so is it know. all right? Beat Saber. Yeah. Oh like, yes, I think I played that. You've, yeah. you've seen it. I have, I've, the, I've the, seen the it one for with sure. The two lightsabers cutting things apart as they go by. Yeah, that's right. Beat Saber. And like, look, this. It's hard to find a good VR game. VR games are difficult. Most games don't adapt well to VR. Like first person shooters as VR is a mistake, man. That's like instant nausea. Right. I mean, but somehow, I, um, oh, I, I, my current, I got what of uh, Oculus Rift or something like that. Yeah, it's quite old right. now, but yeah. I got it because uh, Elite Dangerous, the spaceship, right, right. And I don't understand this, and and you might know, Richard. Why is it that I get instant nausea with like a first person shooter thing? Yes, mm -hmm. but man, I can fly a spaceship for a long time, and I never have any issues at all. N no problem. I, I, mm. I mean, I I have friends who are in the gaming industry who, when the when the VR thing came on, worked on trying to fix games. The main problem with first person shooters is that you move way faster to first person shooter than is normal. Like you literally, like for a Call of Duty that kind of game, you're running at thirty miles an hour. Because mm -hmm. it's boring if you're not. 
And as soon as you put that in your face where the perception of, of speed is more relevant, hmm. your body is deeply concerned. Like it triggers things where in you never have a sense of speed in space. It's not there. You're just true, move, you know, you're just moving. It's it's omnidirectional view. It's not actually effects of acceleration. And that's what's making you nauseous is your body believes it's accelerating but isn't getting the right signals to your balance center. And so it thinks you're poisoned. And so it tries to make you throw everything up. Hmm. Hey guys, uh, I just found this while you guys were talking that that whole issue that I brought up about auto render mode, hmm. looks like that was closed and I'm going to read from the link and I'll give you the, the link. Yeah, send me the link. Show notes. Yeah. So it says auto render mode improvements improves the auto render mode so that components are more responsive and have a decreased initial time to interactivity when WebAssembly resources are not already cached. So these are the improvements. Uh, removes the timeout for loading the boot config. This prevents server interactivity from always being used when the connection quality is poor. Introduces a limit to the maximum parallel WebAssembly resource downloads when an auto component initiates the startup of the WebAssembly runtime. This limit is set to one and overrides any user-specific limit. And fixes an issue where the circuit sometimes remains open even if WebAssembly gets selected for auto interactivity. So there you go. They're working Mm. on it. That's cool. Film at 11. I'll go, I'm going to check it out and I'll tell you how it works. Well, Sanderson's doing the reviews, so I mean, confidence level high. Yeah. yeah. When, yeah. You know, I got him. I don't know who the person is who did this particular work, right? McMillan, Mc, McKinnon Buck. McMinnon Buck. Yeah. But I'm, I'm looking down the reviews and I got to think when you get a comment from Steve Sanderson about your code and the comment is, looks great. Yeah. That's got to be a good day. It's got to feel yeah. nice. Yep. Oh, man. Well, and he says, thinks my work looks great. Well, and he said, you know, when I, because he didn't, he wasn't confident that this was a real bug. So I went and published it to Azure and did the things that he asked me to. And he's like, yeah, that's a bug. Guys, we have to get on this right away. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I'm happy to have contributed to this. Oh, and yeah, the, the contributor is actually a Microsoft employee, too. Yep. So yep. there you go. Awesome. Well, so that's that, good. Re- real time work for a recorded show. I know, right? <laughs> well, but that is the thing, right? The the Blazer team, and this is part of why I'm yeah. so happy to be involved with and and heavily invested in Blazer, is because of exactly this, right? Mm. I mean, they're just it's a very active group, very responsive to GitHub issues. Uh, maybe not always responsive in the way that I would like, but yeah. um, they're not necessarily agreeing with you, but they are disagreeing with you in real time. And that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, I do fine. that with people that contribute or, you know, come into CSLA sometimes too. They're like, yeah, ah, sure. blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, that's interesting. I, 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 I hear you, but it's not the right thing or, you know. Yeah. Um, but you got to admit though, I mean, you must feel like Yoda sometimes when people bring things to you. Is, hmm. A dark spot in the force, I see. Well, <laughs> you know, so so yeah, just about a month ago, somebody contacted me and we did some work. It had a really complicated, well, have a um, set of business logic, which is the, I mean, CSLA should be perfect for that. And they right. built it with CSLA. Mm-hmm. And this one page that was going through like all these super complicated rules and it could take a minute or two to finish. Mm-hmm. And which was ridiculous, right? Um, and so we were looking through this whole thing, and uh, part of it was that Blazor was refreshing the UI constantly because there were fields that were being changed, mm-hmm. right? So we disconnected uh, dur- during this big process, disconnect the UI, right? And so there's no binding. Um, that sped it up by like 30 seconds all by itself because the, the way that Blazor you know, monitors the, the background DOM, you know, it, it, it can, it can, and, and this is not unique to Blazor, right? Windows forms, WPF, we've had this sort of issue forever yep. where data binding can be overly aggressive. Right. Mm. And, but then the other thing is that pretty much all these rules needed the user identity and, um, the, and they didn't want to cache the user identity because they want, like they want admins to be able to go revoke your rights in the middle of using the app. Oh yeah. The customers love that. And I'm like, 
Well, but couldn't you cash? Couldn't you cash it for like just ten seconds? Right. Can you give me some warning? So we ended up adding in, into CSLA, and this is the thing, right? In, so CSLA eight now, and this was not a breaking change. It's just like this transparent enhancement where you can turn mm-hmm. on um, caching for certain types and say, "I would like you to cache um, this user identity query," um, mm. and you know, for ten seconds, and. It what well, basically we went from one to two minutes to run this page down to like two seconds. Wow, wow! Be- dude. Between the the just for a little bit of caching, a little bit of caching, and stopping the UI from data binding refresh constantly. Yep, and right, yeah. Um, so I don't know if that makes me feel like Yoda exactly, but it man, <laughs> that is. <laughs> I mean, talk about satisfying. When we were done yeah. with that, that, I just that gives you a warm, happy feeling, right? Yeah. Yep. Especially for something around the survivors, a perimeter create. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, and I love that sort of short duration cache taking pain away too, right? Like we're not doing any voodoo caching here. You're not going to wait for you deal with a lot of expiry and so on. It's just, hey, this is going to get called a ton. So if we hang on it for just a little while, mm-hmm. we're going to save a lot of external calls. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, but in this case, probably a hundred or two hundred. I mean, it was just yeah. amazing. Yeah, hmm. yeah, right. Wow. Great worker, great solution. It is kind of a workaround. Like, it shouldn't be necess- it Shouldn't be called that much. But this code you can fix. This code well, you can't fix. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's just, always the bouncing act. I just got asked to do a uh, a project in Blazor in auto mode, and uh, I said. You know, it's broken, isn't it? And the guy wrote back and said, no, they just fixed it. So that's how I found it. So there you go. I'm really anxious now to use this in a real project <laughs> uh-huh. now that it works, if it works. Do you think they fixed it in um, uh, 8, 100 or whatever, the or 200, whatever version just came out this week? Or Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that Visual Studio, there's a an update to Visual Studio, which will bring down the latest .NET. So right. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that it's fixed. That's the solution, yeah. So... I feel like all we've talked about for CSL8 is Blazor. Is there anything else that's important? I mean, I, I, 8 is faster than 7, but I don't know if there's much for CSLA to do there. You know, that's the interesting thing is, yes, it is. You know, there's so many better things, but they're automatic. Um, yeah, right. There were very few, maybe no changes. I'm trying to think. I mean, I've been cleaning up the code. You know, as I go in to do some of these other things, you know, Visual Studio keeps coming up and going, hey, there's this new language feature. You should, you know. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of older C Sharp in that code base that could be, yep. quote unquote, modernized. Not that it's broken, <laughs> just that there's new language features. And mm-hmm. and so, but, you know, that doesn't break anything. Yeah. Um, you Unless know, you do it wrong. Well, but <laughs> but see, I, I just, I hit, uh, what do I hit? Control, control, period, and let the refactor thing do the refactoring and nice yeah you know, but i do have to say there's a couple well one in particular it, it keeps wanting to collapse simple if else things down into uh you know the the statement question mark blah colon yeah, i don't blah. like that either oh i hate that uh, you yeah. know that, that so is readable one step too far from readability for me and i agree there's a whole lot of old C programmers that are like, no, that's the way to go. It's been that way for, you know, like, and I'm sorry, but I disagree. It's, it's, no. you, know. you know, you can, I, I said this before recently, and this is something that I've done when I'm writing for a customer and I'm working on their code and they don't understand it. You know, I would take like a link statement and ask chat GPT to explode it into a four four nested for loops with right. comments mm-hmm. and then leave that as a comment in the code. So somebody who wasn't familiar with that syntax could actually see what's going on. And then you could understand. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Are you using chat GPT for anything? Uh, basically what you're talking about, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, I guess I use it constantly and don't actually think about it because it's, um, you know, like IntelliSense on steroids. Right. 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 Um, uh, I don't often just ask for stuff like, you know, go to chat GPT. I rely on copilot that's built in mm-hmm. um, just to be helping me out. And and it is helpful. Um, it is. You know, I uh, sometimes ask chat GPT to make copilot code better 
you know, is there any way to make this better? Mm. Yeah. I'm, from a yeah. non coding perspective, you know, I play tabletop role playing games. And so I've, <laughs> uh, I, I have been uh, using, uh, uh, well, actually, I suppose it's not really Chad GPT. It's more Dolly, isn't it? But uh, creating mm. various graphic assets um, to yeah. li- you know, liven up my, uh, um, some of the gaming. And, and uh, uh, I have started dabbling, though, by, by providing, I love that. providing the historical background of my world. Because we've been mm-hmm. playing in the same world for, you know, like thirty-five years in real of real time, human time. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, upload the historical background of the world, and then asking it to like write poems or, or create a legend about this hero. Very or, cool. uh, wow! And, and it's fiction anyway, so it doesn't have to be perfect in any respect. But exactly. Just leave a feel, and uh, it's I love that. Pretty amazing, actually. If you want to play a fun game. And you don't have anything to do for the next ten minutes. Go to or five minutes. Go to Chat GPT and ask it to create a picture of something food, right? Whatever it is, you know, s- describe some food, and it'll give you a picture. And then say, okay, now make it look more delicious, and see what happens. And do that three or four or five times, mm, even more delicious, even more delicious, and <laughs> you'll be surprised at what you get. And hmm. Does it get? better or does it get horrifying no it gets bigger it's just more of the same so there was a guy in new york who did this with a bagel you know give me a bagels and locks or something like this to, to for his marketing okay now make it more delicious and it just piled on the stuff and it kept going <laughs> until it was like you know a square meter of meat with two two, two bagels <laughs> <laughs> that's not more delicious. That's just impossibly filling. Yeah, it got, it's fun though. You know, you mm. can do it with anything. It's like make it's got it more, it's caught Carnegie Deli disease. Yeah, <laughs> you could just say make it more, and then your favorite adjective, and see what it does, and then keep going. <laughs> yeah, do yeah, then go excessive. <laughs> Give me a puppy. Make it cuter. Make it more cute. More cute. More cute. <laughs> Seven story puppy is cutest puppy of all. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> eyes will be as big as plates by the time you're done. <laughs> uh, well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Rocky, what's next? What are you working on now? Well, I continue to work, of course, on, on CSLA and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I'm working with, uh, uh, well, w- what was Xperit? We just uh, renamed to Zebia. Um, mm-hmm. And, wow. uh, in, in that context, primarily doing cloud modernization type work and GitHub migrations and uh, all sorts of cool stuff like that. And uh, um, so that's pretty neat. And um, but yeah, for, for me, you know, I, I just continue to really be enjoying myself with, with Blazor and, and .NET 8. And, um, and, oh, I guess the other thing that I am working on and, and got a, a new person to jump in and help is uh, a humanitarian toolbox project oh, um, nice that uh, is uh, a kid's ID kit that has <laughs> gone through several iterations thanks to changing web and mobile technologies. Uh, mm. right, right, the current mm. incarnation is actually a, a Blazor Maui hybrid. Um, oh, cool, and I'm feeling the pretty good about Maui that. Program. That's, we're liking it a lot. So that's how I only do Maui apps now, unless I have to hybrid. Hybrid, yeah. It's more consistent. I don't know what you think, Rocky. You still in Zamaland sometimes? Yes. I, I, well, I think for, unless you're, if you're trying to create something that is, has to be really, cons- uh, like native iOS versus native Android feeling, then the Blazor hybrid is not the way to go. But if you're trying to create something where you're mostly concerned about having consistency, I don't care if you're on an iPhone or an Android. I want the yeah. app to work the same way. Um, yeah. and, and I want to be able to contain the cost. Um, yeah. uh, then I think the Blazor Maui hybrid is fantastic because it's amazing. it gives you a pretty darn uh, efficient, from a developer cost perspective, way to mm-hmm. create an app that runs on, and not really just iOS and Android, but also be, can be a Windows and Mac app also. And so it's... Quest 3. Oh, I, yeah, that's 11. true. I hadn't even thought Stay about that one. For that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, we got to run. I got another show to do here. So thanks again, Rocky. It's always great catching up with you. And thanks for being you. It's a pleasure. I mean that. Thank you all very much. Great to chat with you, friend. Okay. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks.
Net Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a time boy.